Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dilip Khatri. Welcome to my channel. I'm a structural engineer based out of Las Vegas, Nevada, with my office in Los Angeles, California, and I work on buildings all over the world. I'm pleased to present to you a presentation that I did for the City County Engineers Association last year on the topic of aging infrastructure. Aging infrastructure has been and continues to be a topic of great concern amongst the owners of the public works and the users, our private sector, because infrastructure defines the economy of a country. Countries with poor infrastructure have to struggle in order to compete in the international marketplace. When a nation invests in their infrastructure, they invest in their future. And it's very important to keep in mind that this investment stimulates economic growth, creates jobs, and provides a basis for a country to accelerate its gross domestic product. And what profession is the most important profession when it comes to infrastructure? It is the profession of civil engineering. The civil engineers make this contribution. We are dedicated to designing the best highways, the safest bridges, the best tunnels, and the best transportation structures in the world. The United States has seen a decline in our, the quality of our infrastructure, which brings us to the topic of how long should a structure last? We're going to talk about this in the presentation today. I'm going to share with you some interesting facts. I hope you enjoy it. And if you are enjoying the series that I've created, kindly give me a subscribe and a like so I can generate more of these educational documentary style videos for the public. Thank you again and welcome to the channel. Welcome to the presentation on aging infrastructure. This was done last year for the City County Engineers Association, and I'm pleased to put this online for you. The topic is aging or getting old. All of our infrastructure eventually ages. Buildings, bridges, highways, ut utility lines, everything has an ultimate time limit. I'm reminded of a famous expression from a very dear professor that I had at the USC School of Business, Dr. Taylor Malone. He was the dean of the, of the business school for many years. And he taught me some everlasting memories here, which I want to impress upon all of you. And that is, time stops for no one and nothing lasts forever. And when you think about this, it's a highly philosophical statement and it's 100% true. Time eventually will erode everything that we've created on this planet. It's been proven century after century. And nothing that we do as a civilization will last forever. It may last a long time, but eventually everything will deteriorate and will start over again. And here is our first example of why time stops for no one. This is me today. And if we take a look at me 40 years ago, and this is me 40 years ago, 1983, when I graduated from college, I was 18 years old. And this is me at the age of 20, when I finished my master's degree, 1985. And this is me about a year ago, looking a little bit better, but you can see I'm hiding quite a few facts of nature behind the hat. My college graduation photo with three of my college buddies, 1983, when we all graduated with our bachelor's degree from Cal State LA. So let's get on with the four basic structural materials that we've been building infrastructure out of for decades, for centuries actually. And those would be masonry, which has been around for 5,000 years, concrete, at least 1,000 years, steel being relatively new, 
about 200 years, and wood, which has been used for 500 years but has become a main staple for the United States, North America, not so much in other parts of the world, but definitely in North America. There are many factors that affect the aging process of a structure, and these are just a few of them. Time, weather, water, the elements, wind, tornadoes and storms, earthquakes, hurricanes, subsidence, landslides, termites, mold, flood, explosions, fire, and war. And we don't design for all of these. We try to design for as many as we can, but no one can really predict what the future life is of a structure. We'd like to believe that it's going to last forever, but we know that it certainly won't last forever. One thing for sure, all infrastructure, all buildings require maintenance. Maintenance is very important. And this is a result of what's happening in the United States today with our infrastructure. This is the report card given by the American Society of Civil Engineers on the infrastructure of the USA as of 2021. And the average grade is roughly a C minus. And you can see a lot of these elements are, border are bordering on a failing grade. The transit infrastructure, stormwater, hazardous waste, these are all in the D category. Dams, which is a highly dangerous category when you think about it, hovering in the D category, which just shows that we have to make an investment in our infrastructure to keep up with the world economy. I want to start with one of my favorite structures of all time, an architectural masterpiece, the Taj Mahal in Agra, India took 22 years to construct, built by the Emperor Shah Jahan as a gift and a memoriam for his wife, Mumtaz, whom he loved very much, and he wanted to build a structure. He wanted to build a monument that would show the whole world what the meaning of love was, and I think he definitely accomplished it. It's been in service for close to 400 years, constructed of stone and marble. And even though the Jumna River is eroding the site, the marble is discoloring from pollution, the Taj Mahal remains as a magnificent statement of ancient architecture and superb construction practices that build monuments to last, monuments that stay almost forever, that we hope could live beyond our lifetimes. The Taj Mahal is definitely what I would consider as a success story. And then of course we have in Rome, St. Peter's Basilica, which took over 20 years to construct, has completed close to 400 years of service, well-maintained, clean, and no structural issues to date. A magnificent piece of architecture wonderfully built, all done in the 17th century. You can see the interior, magnificent piece of artwork, absolutely pristine, a magnificent monument to both structural engineering, architecture, art, and after all it's intended to be, it is the house of God. And it definitely has quite an impact on you when you walk into this basilica. 400 years of service and just a wonderful piece of design, art, architecture, and structural engineering. And then we go to San Francisco, to the Golden Gate Bridge, another magnificent work of structural engineering, architecture, and in my opinion, a wonderful piece of art that has been in service for close to 100 years. The Golden Gate Bridge took four years to construct. It took 22 years to get the permits and costed $36 million in 1936, completing 86 years of service and over 2 billion cars that it has safely carried across the San Francisco Bay, generating over $120 million of revenue per year. 
in spite of the fact that steel rusts, the salt water will eventually erode the steel components of the Golden Gate Bridge. It's properly maintained, built during the Great Depression by Joseph Strauss and a magnificent emblem of civil engineering that has lasted us almost 100 years. But it will eventually end because steel will erode to the point where eventually those cables will not be able to be repaired. That moment hasn't arrived yet, but there is definitely a terminal deadline on the Golden Gate Bridge. And now we turn our attention to something more current. In the same city of San Francisco, the Millennium Tower, constructed approximately 2012, 2015, 605 feet tall, condominium residences at a cost of over $500 million. The designers of this structure did not put the foundation piles deep enough to reach bedrock. They were short of bedrock. The original pilings were 60, are 60 to 90 feet deep, and the building is sinking. The building is tilting and it's sinking. And this is a modern day structure built with today's technology with supposedly advanced analysis, the tools that were not present there 100 years ago and beyond. And I personally think it's an absolute disaster and an embarrassment to our profession that a structure of this size is experiencing these kinds of problems. And here you can see some of the statistics completed in 2009 58-story high-rise building, 645 feet tall, $600 million, 1.15 million square feet. Critical design error by not putting the piles to reaching bedrock. An absolute structural engineer error and a geotechnical error. The building is sinking. Right at the time of this presentation, it has tilted 28 inches horizontally. And the retrofit engineer proposed installing new piles to bedrock at a cost of uh, approximately $100 million. And that's what's underway as of the time of making this presentation. As they say, the fix is to install these new piles to go down 250 feet to reach the bedrock. They couldn't retrofit the entire perimeter, so they're retrofitting only part of the perimeter and as the retrofit engineer explains that the building will eventually sink into being level. This is uh, the firm represented by Mr. Ron Hamburger, who's a very prominent structural engineer in our profession, who's been in charge of this project. And it certainly has not been going very smoothly during the repair process as the building continues to sink. And again, it's not his fault that the situation is what it is. It's the fault of the previous designers, the original designers, for not taking those piles down deep enough. And then we have the disaster of the bridge designed by Fig Engineers, a very famous bridge engineering company based out of Florida. And this bridge collapsed. And it was a very sad day because the bridge was just getting ready to be opened, a brand new bridge, and it collapsed. The bridge was going into construction phase one. It collapsed during a repost tensioning phase. The National Transportation Safety Board investigated and made these conclusions that the design error, the design engineer had made an error, that's FIG engineering, that there were miscalculations underestimated the stress values and incorrect construction sequence and did not stop the construction with observed cracks. These are the conclusions coming from the NTSB. And again, this is a modern day construction with all of the techniques, the tools, the calculation capacity that we have today. And unfortunately, this happened. Again, a sad testament to modern day construction. There is a full report on the bridge collapse provided by the NTSB, which discusses exactly what happened. 
and that's available to you uh, online. These are some highlights uh, from the slide that uh, from the report that show exactly what happened. We go to Florida now at Surfside, just near Miami. And we have the collapse of the condominium complex that killed approximately 160 people. A terrible tragedy. The building was approximately 40 years old. We still don't know what the cause of the collapse is. It's still under investigation and we're waiting for the report. Surfside Collapse, also known as Champlain Tower, built in 1965, 160 people died. It's a reinforced concrete flat plate design. There were definitely water issues in the building. There were issues of sinking of the building and soil subsidence. NIST is still investigating. They have a report forthcoming. The structural engineer did give a warning letter to the HOA three years before the collapse. So at least somebody was paying attention. But unfortunately, that HOA did not take that warning seriously. And this is why you have such a catastrophic loss of life. When this NIST report comes out, I'll definitely be reporting on it and will share some of my observations. I have prepared a series of four documentary style videos on this collapse, which is available on my channel. Please feel free to take a look at that where I dive a little deeper into this topic. And then we can go back into history here and look at some other failed projects of the modern era. There is the Aswan Dam in Egypt, which actually, when you dig a little deeper into the history, you'll learn that there were two dams that were built. The first one was built by the British, which was not tall enough. It was too short and the water overflowed the dam. This was a tremendous embarrassment for the government of Egypt. And Egypt eventually, it, it was such a serious event that it pushed Egypt towards the communist government of Russia. And they went to the Russian engineers that designed the current dam, which is behind upstream the British dam and has serviced the Egyptian economy and the Egyptian government very well. And this was clearly a design error. And then we have in Japan, the Kansai airport, two artificial islands created in the sea, 26 million cubic yards of fill with an original cost estimate of $8 billion that soared to $20 billion. And the original estimated settlement was 13 feet. The current settlement is 38 feet. And they have about another 13 feet to go before they sink into the ocean. And my question is, how do you make mistakes like this? How does this happen on a major international project of this scale with billions of dollars? How does that happen? How do geotechnical engineers miss that one? I would like to know. And this is a historical photo of the original British dam designed by the British, which eventually was too short. This is a construction photo. And this is the final dam built by the Soviets that pushed Egypt politically into their sphere of influence because the British couldn't design the dam correctly. And we have more examples of failed projects, in my opinion. The Fern Hollow Bridge in Pittsburgh collapsed in January of 2022. The cause is still under investigation. The failure occurred the same day President Biden was to give a speech on infrastructure funding. The bridge collapsed on the day of his speech. And then we have the Burj Khalifa, the world's tallest building at 2,700 feet in Dubai. The building is fine. It's a very tall building, 3.3 million square feet at a cost of $1.5 billion, designed by the American A&E firm Skidmore, Owings & Merrill. But the interesting thing I bring up with this project is that somebody, I don't know why, designed the world's tallest building without a sewage system. And the entire building functions on septic tanks, which have to be emptied daily by trucks, which I think is an absolute disaster. 
that you would design the world's tallest building and not have it connected to a sewage system. I don't understand why, but it is what it is. And here you have a shot of the Burj Khalifa, 2,700 feet without a sewage system. And we have a series of other failures that have occurred in the last uh, 30, 40 years, and one going back almost 100 years. The 1928 St. Francis Dam failure, which was designed by William Mulholland and failed due to defective soil foundation system, and that flooded quite a bit of the community and caused a lot of property damage and deaths. And then 1971, the Silmar earthquake caused the collapse of the Silmar House Hospital. 1989, the Loma Prieta earthquake collapsed the 880 freeway. 1994, the Northridge earthquake collapse of the 14 freeway bridge over the 5, Interstate 5. 1994, collapse of the Kaiser Permanente Hospital building. And 1994, collapse of the Northridge Meadows Apartments. So you can see that engineering is an evolving science. It's a practice oriented field where we learn from our mistakes. We, I should say, we hopefully learn from our mistakes so that we can improve in the future. So here's an example of a state of California project at the university where I used to teach at California State Polytechnic Pomona. The administration building you see here with the innovative architecture that was done was under construction during my time there when I was teaching at Cal Poly Pomona, which was in the 1990s. And they eventually found that this building was built directly on an earthquake fault. The building was designed by a firm outside of California in Arizona, which apparently did not have a lot of experience with seismic design, which begs the question, why would you go to a firm outside of California when we have hundreds of firms here at least dozens of firms that are qualified to do this type of, type of project. And this was administered by the state of California, by the DSA, and it's an utter disaster. The Cal Poly Pomona Administration Building, built in 1992, costed $24 million, 200,000 square feet, had tile, exterior tile, imported from India. The architect of record, Antoine Predoc, won several awards through the AIA and they were later on it was discovered that there were numerous construction defects they found an earthquake fault during construction I mean how do you make a mistake like that I don't understand how you can miss that and how the state of California expended these funds spent over 24 million dollars and then find out there's an earthquake fault under the building in the middle of construction the steel connections were not designed for California standards and there were water leakage problems. And so what was the final conclusion? They had to demolish the building. They tore it down. They removed it from the site. $24 million and almost 30 years of time wasted, completely wasted on something that should not have happened. And the other sad reality is that there's no conversation about this in the press. There might have been one small article in the Los Angeles Times, but it didn't get any press attention. And this is the kind of thing which wastes government funds on things when it's just strictly incompetence, absolute incompetence on the part of the state and on the part of the DSA. And I can bet you that those people that administered this project are still working for the state or have retired with no consequences to them. It's an absolute sham. And then we go to the Panama Canal, a success story for the Americans. But the original Panama Canal was pursued by the French. And the mistake that the French made was that they wanted to connect the Atlantic and the Pacific with a sea level canal. In other words, it wouldn't go up and it wouldn't go down. It would be at sea level. And what they learned after wasting more than 10 years that they miscalculated it was a serious civil engineering blunder that led to thousands of workers dying because the amount of dirt and excavation that you had to do to go from 
the Atlantic to the Pacific, was too much. It was impossible. It couldn't be done. And they learned it the hard way. Eventually, they had to withdraw. They had to withdraw from the project. And that's when the United States came in and they developed the system of locks and created a new lake in order to raise the ships so that the ships could go from one ocean to the other. A monumental achievement, but wasn't learned on the first try. It had to be learned on the second try. The biggest casualty of the Panama Canal was one of my favorite engineers of all time, a monument to the profession, and that is Mr. Gustav Eiffel, the great engineer who had designed and built the Eiffel Tower and the Statue of Liberty was the project engineer on the Panama Canal. And it turned into a major litigation event in his life. He was implicated. He was wrongly accused of fraud. He was convicted and he was sentenced to prison. And he eventually was acquitted through an appeal, but it left an indelible impression on Gustav Eiffel. He left civil engineering to pursue other interests in aerodynamics and meteorology. An unfortunate event for such a great man who had accomplished so much, but this project took a tremendous toll on his reputation. And so what are some of the lessons that I hope you will gain from this talk today? Every material has time limits. We need to think things through. We can't rely on calculations from computers. Do your math. Use your judgment, experience and research the design, and look at the history and learn. And don't just expect that a computer software program is going to tell you how to design a building. A software program is merely a tool. Of the materials that we've used, masonry has had the longest history with over 500 years, actually going back 5,000 years if you can, when you go back to the pyramids. Reinforced concrete is a relatively new material. We're still, we are still learning about rebar corrosion. And do not separate your responsibility from the whole project. Professional engineers are in responsible charge. We can't expect to pass off our responsibility to others. We've got to look at the entire project and we've got to be accountable. Continuing on with lessons to learn, when we think of our cars, we have to maintain them. We don't expect our cars to last forever. Our teeth have to be maintained. Our health has to be maintained. But yet there is no maintenance code for buildings. The statute of limitations in California for design professionals is four years for a patent defect, 10 years for a latent defect. So we have very limited research on long-term performance. No research on building settlement and its effects on structural capacity. There's still a lot of things that we're learning in this industry. And sometimes I think we need to go backwards in time and learn from our predecessors who seem to have gotten a lot of things right. So masonry, I think, has the best long-term performance even though it may be missing steel reinforcement. But eventually, the deterioration of the mortar is what causes masonry to fail. It's a rigid and stiff structure. In terms of checking masonry buildings, we want to be looking closely at the mortar joints and the cracking. We want to check for soil subsidence to see if the building is sinking. And we want to check wall alignment. We want to see if the building is not aligned properly. That gives us a signal whether something bad is going to happen. We want to check to see if the foundation is moving. And we want to be periodically inspecting masonry buildings for tension cracks. For steel structures, we should be checking for corrosion and rust on a regular basis. We should be looking at fatigue and fracture failure. We should always be checking bolts, checking wells, using test methods, checking for soil subsidence, checking the alignment of beams and columns, checking the foundation movement, and again, doing periodic inspection for water, because water is the biggest enemy. It is the agent of change, the agent of deterioration. This is an example of rust and deterioration inside a high-rise building in the parking structure on one of my projects. 
where we are witnessing excessive amount of rust due to continuous water leakage. And this will eventually erode the building framework and could lead to a catastrophic collapse. For reinforced concrete and pre-stressed or post-tension beams, again, corrosion and rust is a primary concern. Fatigue and fracture failure. And some of the same things that we mentioned earlier, checking the rebar, checking the concrete strength, checking the post-tension values for relaxation losses. Because as post-tensioned cords relax, the structure will begin to sag. Checking for soil subsidence. Again, beam column alignment, foundation movement, and again, performing periodic inspections, looking for water leakage. All very important parameters for checking our pre-stressed and post-tensioned structures. This is an example from one of our projects of a subterranean parking structure that's experiencing excessive cracking. And these kind of things are happening all over the country. This is in Southern California. And you can see that the owners have already noticed this cracking for many years and they have these injection ports. They've been injecting grout to fill these cracks, but that's not a structural repair. And this could eventually develop into something rather serious. You can see that the water is leaking through the slab. You can see the white discoloration from the efflorescence. And this requires proper structural examination and repair. The United States and Canada is unique in the world that North America uses 75% of the building space are type 5 wood frame structures. There's no other place on the planet that uses wood as its primary building envelope. And wood is highly susceptible to termites and mold. It's also susceptible to these other impacts of soil subsidence. And the way you can check these is checking the alignment of the building, the foundation movement, and of course, periodic inspection for water leakage. Termites in particular have caused an excessive amount of damage, which makes me say that wood structures, generally speaking, you have a tough time getting more than 80 years of service life out of them. Although there are wood buildings that have lasted more than 100 years, for sure. But those were designed using a different quality of wood with larger members. In today's day and age, where we're using smaller pieces of lumber and we're building taller and building bigger with higher loads, termites and mold will eventually eat the building alive. And so you have to pay attention to these things. And this is an example of excessive termite and moisture damage. And this is a fairly expensive com community. And you can see from the stucco that everything looks just fine until you open it up and then you see what the deterioration is. And this project is a country club level home, uh, I should say homes, and uh, this required a lot of reconstruction in order to deal with these issues. Some conclusions and thoughts for you. Civil engineer projects service hundreds or thousands of people with billions of dollars of investment. And we have compressed our time schedules from our predecessors. Now everything is run by the clock. We have to finish projects on very tight time deadlines because the urgency of time and money supersede quality, safety, and long-term performance. And I urge you as professionals to stand up and speak up when you see these violations occurring and don't compromise quality management. Don't compromise the structural integrity of your project. Independent review is vital. Experience is gold. Civil engineering requires maturity, education, and learning from the history of others. It's best to learn from other people's mistakes than make your own. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. I thank you for attending.